Africa. Namibia, formerly a German colony, lies in the southwestern part of the continent. To the north, the Kunini forms the border with Angola, and to the south, the Orangi marks the border with South Africa. The colonial powers divided the land in the 19th century, separating it from today's Botswana to the east. Sand and gravel dominate vast areas of the country. The Namib, the oldest desert in the world, spans 2,000 kilometers of the country from north to south and extends up to 500 kilometers inland from the coast. In the native language, Namib fittingly means broad, rough plain. Only when seeing it from the air does one begin to appreciate the true extent of its vastness and its many facets. It becomes incredibly cold during the night and the sun needs a good two hours in the morning to heat the desert back up to being a glowing oven of nature. The Namib is a land of extremes in which only particularly well-suited life forms can hope to survive. The Namibian sidewinder adder covers its moisture needs with drops of dew which form on its rough snake skin. Even its method of locomotion is beautifully suited to the desert conditions. The snake's side winding motion moves it forward unusually quickly and provides the least possible direct contact to the hot sand. Thanks to this technique, the puff adder is one of the fastest snakes in the world. During the day, it buries itself in the cooling sand until only its eyes, nose, and the tip of its tail show. Its eyes are located on the top of the head, something rarely seen in the snake kingdom. Nature could not have provided a better method of lurking under a perfect camouflage cover. The variety of Namibia's wildlife is also reflected in the diversity of its inhabitants. Among the total of seven local types of small lizards, the Namibian web-footed gecko, also known as the palmetto gecko, is the only one that is active at night. Its skin seems to be as thin as parchment, and its conspicuous coloring is rather unusual for a nocturnal animal. At daybreak, the gecko seeks protection from the desert heat by digging as much as 80 centimeters into the sand, which is much cooler at that depth. His shovel-like front feet come in handy for that task, the palmetto gecko's toes are joined by flaps of skin, similar to the webbed appendages of water animals. The darkling beetle's body virtually floats high over the hot sand on its long legs. Darkling beetles feed primarily on plant remains, something that is normally rare in the desert. But the beetle has an ally. It's the wind. It blows unceasingly over the Namib, carrying minuscule plant particles for thousands of miles. So, for the small beetle, the desert is a land of plenty, where his food literally flies right to him. Relatives of this beetle exist all over the world. One such is the European flower beetle, whose larvae, the mealworm, are raised for fish food. The darkling beetle also burrows into the sand. He doesn't do it to find protection from the sun, however. He uses this method to hide from predators. How can insects and reptiles even survive in such an inhospitable desert? Or how do they get here in the first place? A possible answer is to be found in Dead Flay, the Valley of Death in the Namibian Naukluf National Park. Dead Flay is the endpoint of a former river which deposited so much clay that it needed to find another bed to flow in. The surrounding trees died off one after the other due to the lack of water. This occurred about 500 years ago, but the process of decay is extremely slow in the dry desert climate. The water flow decreased gradually, possibly over thousands of years. Animals had plenty of time to adjust to the new conditions or to wander off to more suitable environments.
the Namaqua, or the desert chameleon, preferred to adjust to the conditions of the harsh environment. A few insects like the darkling beetle and a few plant particles are all the reptile needs to survive. His lifestyle in the moonscape of the desert, however, is rather boring. Even today, there are rivers that penetrate deep into the Namib, at least temporarily. 400 kilometers inland, the desert turns into a hilly, rocky plateau. The country's few natural springs bubble up between these rocks. Every couple of years, massive rainstorms inundate the land. Then the dry riverbeds actually carry water. But most of the time, the spring water runs underground, unseen and unreachable by man or beast. And yet some valleys do offer habitat for humans and animals. In Namibia, living creatures make their home in places so inhospitable that it is hard to imagine that it would even be possible for them to survive there. Elephants have an enormous daily requirement of water and food. That drives them into the most remote small valleys, into which the sun only shines with its full force a few hours a day. Not far from the Himba village lies the Hoanib River Valley, now just a dry bed. The Hoanib flows with water only a few days a year. Yet there is always enough moisture underground for a few plants to grow in the dry riverbed. We also find tracks that leave no doubt that elephants have been here. Dieter Risser, an expert on elephants, reads from the tracks that the animals must have marched through here already a few days ago. He can tell which way they went from the indentations in the footprints. The desert elephant population in the Kaukofeld is estimated to be about 600 animals. They have adapted to the harsh landscape in a very unique way. Often, they travel up to 70 kilometers between their feeding grounds and their water sources. The marching tempo of the herd is determined by the strength of the young calves, because long marches like that take their toll on the energy reserves of the large animals. The Huanib doesn't offer any surface water at the moment, but at least there is some greenery. The desert dwellers are not picky. They eat leaves and young sprouts, as well as bark, blossoms, or fruit. Even roots, onions, and tubers are welcome sources of energy. A grown elephant consumes up to 100 kilograms of plant matter per day. Elephants instinctively consume only a certain amount of any one plant, because each plant contains different important nutrients. How the animals are able to differentiate between plants, which are more or less nutritious, has hardly been researched at all. The leading animal of a desert elephant herd is always a cow. She leads the trek and the rest of the family follows, her sisters, aunts and cousins, as well as their offspring. The bull provides protection from the rear. He also makes sure that no one gets separated from the group. The secret to the desert elephant's survival lies in their fantastic memory. They remember the location of hidden water reserves and feeding grounds, even over several years. They pass this knowledge on from generation to generation the paths of the desert elephants are often hundreds of years old. Based on latest DNA tests, scientists assume that the desert elephant, like the forest and savanna elephant, is a unique species. Relative to their body size, they have larger ears and broader feet. They are more stable on the sand thanks to the larger foot surface. The soles of the feet also serve to sort of listen to ground vibrations. The lead cow plants her feet on the ground like stethoscopes and listens for the presence of water flowing underground. Thanks to their unusual ability to find water, the desert elephants often secure the survival of other animals as well.
At Namibia's western border, the desert ends at the ocean shore. The cold, nutrient-rich Benguela current flows along this barren coast. Every morning, condensing ocean water forms a broad bank of fog along the edge of the Namib. From time to time, the billows of fog penetrate deep into the interior of the desert. To miss this life-giving fog would mean certain death for the darkling beetle. As soon as the beetle reaches the highest point of a dune, he turns into the wind and freezes in that position. He waits in that position until dewdrops form on his hard exoskeleton. This unique moisture collection strategy gives him an advantage over all other desert dwellers. Its tanks freshly filled, the beetle is a virtual water reservoir, and the gecko knows that. And as all predators in the Namib, the gecko gets all the moisture he needs through his prey alone. He sets his sights on his prey, waits for the right moment, and springs right into the jaws of death. The failed attack of the gecko, however, does not mean that the beetle is in safety yet. He is far too appetizing a target, both as nourishment and as a thirst quencher. Should he happen to wander within range of the desert chameleon's tongue, it's all over. The wind drives the humid ocean air up to 300 kilometers inland. On a few days a year, even rain clouds drive into the hill country of the interior and release their precious moisture there. In shady places, water holes remain long after the rain has passed. These temporary oases attract a wide variety of animals, even giraffes. and the largest African eagle, the Marshall Eagle. The elephants have also been drawn here, and they fully enjoy the reward of their long march, fresh water. Even though the river valley provides a relatively comfortable living environment for the animals, only very few of them make it their permanent home. Even the nama, flying fowl, are only visitors. They store water in their breast feathers and transport it over great distance to quench the thirst of their young in their nesting grounds. The bull elephant has discovered an anna tree, a type of acacia, with ripe fruit the pods hang high in the tree, too high even for the elephant. But the intelligent animal knows what to do about that. Anna trees are common to the dry riverbeds of the northern Namib. Their nutritious pods are a feast for the wild animals and the cattle of the Himba. Here, a rival male must be overcome and driven off, proving superior strength and manifesting the rights to rule over the group. The bulls smash into each other with tons of violent energy the animals could be very badly wounded. Whether the lead cow is happy with the results of the battle remains her secret. But in this case, the old bull remains as chief of his harem. The vanquished youngster will have to find another bull to challenge. In any case, there will be a wedding night of sorts. Victory in battle arouses the mating lust in every bull elephant. Humans and animals live with the desert winds of the inhospitable Namib. 
They live differently, simply, but are seemingly happy nonetheless. Otherwise, they surely would have left this fairy tale landscape of sand long ago.